Next on BYU Sports Nation, the biggest game of all. Why week one may be the most important game of Kalani Satake's head coaching career. Our opponent preview continues as we look at the week three matchup with USC. Will they be better than last year's five and seven team? Plus, BYU basketball assistant Nick Robinson joins us to discuss what Nick Emery's departure means for the roster. Let's go. This is BYU Sports Nation, brought to you by the BYU Store, simulcast on BYU TV and BYU Radio. Now, from Studio B, here's Spencer Linton and Jerem Jordan. Oh, gather around. BYU Sports Nation is live. Your day-to-day play-by-play in Studio B, presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Friday, July 26th. No. The rest of it? No. <laughs> Whether you have your voice or not, okay? the show must go on. You okay? I'm absolutely okay. Your voice doesn't sound okay. <laughs> Sometimes you lose your voice, right? It happens. Wherever and however you're connected, great to have you with us. I am Spencer Linton. Believe it or not, radio listeners are like, who is this guy? Yeah. Is Shep in the building just in case? Do we know this? Good. We're good. <laughs> the man I'm sitting next to loves nothing more than to play in front of 60,000 sober white people in any event. His name is Jerem Jordan. I love it. Uh, Utah defensive end Bradley and I was quoted at Pac-12 Media Days saying, quote, there's nothing worse than playing in front of 60,000 sober white people. This according to at Penguin of Troy, which is Alicia de Artola, a USC reporter for Reign of Troy. This quote went viral when sports business reporter and producer Darren Ravel with his 2 million Twitter followers oh boy. put it out there. Okay, so uh, is, he, is he wrong about the makeup of the crowd? Ah, not really. It's mo- whatever. It doesn't. The demographics of the crowd don't really matter. Sober, it's like, what does that have to do with it? Stone Cold Sober. Yeah. 60,000. That's more than can fit in Utah Stadium. Like, whatever. Anyway, and I continued, to be fair, there's more to the quote. Uh, but all jokes aside, it's a cool environment. See, he said something nice. Yes. Everyone's like, Rah! there's more to the quote. Lavelle Edwards Stadium has a lot of history. My coach, Kyle Winningham, played there. My dad played there. It's a big place. Uh, and the energy there is different. It's a fun place for an away game. Oh, by the way, his uncle played there, I believe. <clears throat> is that Robert and I? His uncle? Yes. Um, so, yeah, Bradley and I is really good. He's a really good defense player. You're going to see him in the 10 and 10 with defense players. First team all Pac-12. Yeah, those comments are uh, they're fun. They're preseason. The game's in five hey. weeks. Like, it's all good, man. It's all good. Yes, it is. And, again, in his defense, the whole quote is critical here. You can't just focus on one little sentence. You have to go with the context all right. and around And the first it. part was critical. <laughs> Twitter is a slippery slope. We all know it. You and I know it better than most. Twitter is a weird place sometimes, and things get taken out of context all the time. So be careful with that because people ran with it, and Bradley and I didn't intend for it to be just that thing. Clearly, right? Or did he? <laughs> He's a youth. Let's not forget that part. He's being talked about, right? <laughs> Great show lineup for you today. Athletic writer. Of USC football, Antonio Morales. Are Not, you saying he's athletic or he writes for the athletic? He's both. Oh, okay. He writes for well, the athletic. I don't think we know whether he's athletic. I'm guessing Let's he ask is. him. Say, All right, we will ask if him. If you write for the athletic, are you required to be athletic? A quarterback edition of Just the Stats plus BYU Ben's basketball assistant coach Nick Robinson on how the roster is impacted now that Nick Emery is not with the team. Here are today's BYU Sports Nation headlines. Speaking of BYU men's basketball, head coach Mark Pope hires Nathan uh, Nathan Bubas as the new coordinator of strategy and analytics. Bubas' main responsibilities include players, coaches, and recruiting film, self-scouting, and opponent scouting, and conducting post-game reports and collecting recruitment data. That's a lot. Bubas previously worked as a coaching associate for the LA Lakers in the National Basketball Association during the 2018-19 season. Mark Pope is really excited about having this guy. He's the video coordinator, but it, but it's more than that. He incorporates more analytics and strategy than the previous video coordinator was asked to do. Team Fredette and Coach Rose come from behind to beat the City Team Blazers 99-96 after trailing by 22 points uh, in the third quarter. Uh, big win for Team Fredette. Tyler Haas started in the game. Only played four minutes, didn't record a stat. So I'm not sure why he is on the team if he's not going to play that much. Kind of weird. Team Fredette plays Challenge ALS at 11 Eastern on ESPN3 tonight. How about this? BYU grad Connor McMillan 
taking fourth place in the USA Track and Field Outdoor Championships with a time of 28-2018. McMillan took third in the NCAA 10K earlier this year. The guy continues to impress. And you, that's big time. How do you take third in the NCAA and then fourth in the whole country with all the pros? That's amazing. And junior defensive lineman Uriah Leatawa is on the Werfel Trophy watch list, which recognizes the player who excels in a combination of community service and athletic and academic achievements. The watch list for the Paul Hornig Award for most versatile player did not have any Cougars. Perhaps Jaron Hall will make that award watch list next year. All rise and shout. It is time for What's Trending. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's What's Trending on BYU Sports Nation. And it is time we play Would You Rather, presented by BYU Food to Go, the MVP of your next event. Chantel Jennings of The Athletic. She's been on the show before, released an article yesterday. Is she athletic? And she's wise, she? Jaron, because she understands just how much attention is being paid to this BYU-Utah rivalry game. Any good writer is going to try and target a demographic and know that the reading will take place, right? Yeah, you you want to get a lot of views. Clickbait, baby. She said that while Utah got the better deal leaving the Mountain West and going to the Pac-12. Are you sure about that? BYU. <laughs> got the national exposure and access to their fans. So each side got a little something better than the other. But the question now is, Jerem, would you rather be in a Power Five or keep the direct exposure to national fans? I think I know how you're going to answer this. Yeah, I, you lost me at would you rather be in a Power Five. I didn't hear the last part. Exactly. Did you say something exactly. else? Exactly. Uh, in a Power Five conference, you get big TV money, at least $25 million. That's on the low end, Right. If you win the league, you're likely to be in the college football playoff. There are teams who don't, but you're likely to be in it. Um, if you're second in the league, you probably play in a New Year's Six game, you know, and there's big money there. If BYU was in a Power Five conference, but all the games were on Amazon Prime at 9 a.m., I would be happy yes. with the situation because the schedule you play, the access you have, the money you have, that would all be great. It's the best ball. It's the most money. That's the end game. Get there and build up. It's taken Utah nine seasons to get to a point where they felt like they could actually win the league and are validated in that idea. It took them eight seasons to get an outright division title. If BYU got to a power five, they would struggle mightily, probably a losing season or two or three in the first couple years. But that would be just fine because once you're in, you're in. Nobody's been kicked out of one in this modern era. So once you're in, you're in. I would way rather be in a Power 5. It is nice to be on ESPN. They help with the schedule. That's all awesome with the Bulls. But it's the next best thing. It's not the best thing. Hey, listen, remember when BYU was playing on the network that shall not be named? Voldemort. Yeah, and you oh, know what, you know what yeah. I'm talking about. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. okay, for those that don't know. <laughs> well, if you don't know, you, what? <sighs> The mountain. the mountain. Okay. From from here on to forth on BYU Sports Nation. Not the mountain. We will not mention that network other than saying the network that shall not be named. Versus. Okay. Okay. BYU fans found a way to watch the Cougars. Okay. It, it's well, it's, some didn't. Most most did. Okay. There are easier ways to watch BYU. If they went to a Power Five conference like the Pac-12, then when they were playing on the mountain, like yeah, it's ESPN and Fox, FS1, Pac-12 Network. Pac well, some people say, well, you can't see their games because they're on the Pac-12 Network. You'll find a way, whether it's Sling or YouTube TV well, it's or not something. Every game streaming through the Pac-12 Network.com directly onto your TV. Like technology has changed, so they'll find a way. What BYU doesn't have the option of right now which they would have in a Power 5 conference, is the continual revenue stream that would be coming into the athletic program. Good grief. Of course, this is an easy answer. You would rather be in a Power 5 conference. Yeah. It's not close. Yeah, it's not close. It's not even close. Yeah. Is there some consolation because BYU is not in a Power 5 conference and have an ESPN deal? Yeah, it, it, it speaks to the brand. That's nice. But in terms of comparing one to the other, this is ridiculous. This is, hey, 
Do you want an all-expenses-paid trip to Hawaii and stay in a five-star resort for two weeks, or do you want to go to Cody, Wyoming for two days? Now, you just offended the sensibilities of our no amazing no. fans in Cody, Wyoming, I'm... home of the Rainbow Room and tennis shoes among the Nephites. Okay, then Laramie, Wyoming. There Should we go. do that? Yeah, Laramie. You want, you yeah. Want a... Laramie, yeah, Laramie, we don't care. You want two days in Laramie, or do you want two weeks in Hawaii? This is not dumb, close. This is the dumbest question this I've ever heard. This is not close. Topic two. Hit it. Hit the it. Countdown to the youths. 34 days. Oh, man, my voice sounds so good. Yeah. It sounds so good right now. Jason, you're on the <laughs> Number 34, Kalani Sitake. Yeah, He was baby. number 34. Yeah, 34 baby. Days. Uh, he begins year four of his tenure as head coach at Brigham. The Utes are the first challenge on the schedule. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, BYU, 0-3 against Utah mm-hmm. in the Sitake tenure. 1-8 against rivals overall. <sighs> so, Spencer, is the Utah game the most important game in the Sitake era up to this point? Yes, Jerem. Let's discuss everything that goes into this game and the potential ramifications it could have for Kalani Satake. You want to talk about the ultimate buzz killer, first and foremost, for Utah's most hyped season ever? If BYU beats the team that's picked to win the Pac-12 and is going to be a top 15 team that they have no business being on the field with and all of the things that we sarcastically said a few days ago, Oh, my goodness. Like, this is the win of wins. It would easily be the biggest win of the Kalani Satake era. Yes. Okay? The rivalry. Bigger than Wisconsin, surprisingly. game losing streak against the rivals. And people want to know why Kalani Satake doesn't have a a public contract extension and all this stuff. He might get a contract extension after the game. It's a five-year plan. Two more years, people. He might get a contract extension after the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he might. No, you're right. The, I agree with you that this is the biggest game, the most important game in the Satake era. And it's sort of a hot take, right? But the setup is such that Utah's won eight in a row. BYU's, BYU missed a two-point conversion, right? They, they've been, they were up 20. You know, there have been moments where BYU has a 4-9 and nine team that has a drive to go win the game. They've lost you know in the I mean? most excruciating yes. ways possible. BYU found a new way to lose, right? This is a huge game. This is a top 15 team. This is a power 5 team picked to win its league. Uh, they'll be in the top 15. This is a big deal. Kalani has to beat rivals, or at some point none of the, the other stuff matters. Because right now, we all like Kalani as a person, right? BYU's one game over 500 in his tenure. That's not good enough. We think BYU's going to be better, and he's going to continue to uh, evolve, and this program will get good. A lot of that has to do with Zach Wilson. If Zach Wilson's good and, and BYU's good and BYU beats Utah, boom, baby, now it feels different. If BYU wins two out of three against Boise State and Utah State, now it feels different, and we can shed the past and embrace the present and future, but you have to win to do it. So, yes, this is the most important game, and not because it's the next one, in the Satake era. Absolutely. Yes, bigger than beating Wisconsin at Wisconsin. It is. Yes. Because Utah is now – perceived as that caliber of team. Yes. And as you aptly pointed out in the conversation we had earlier this morning, it's in Provo where Kalani has not won as many games as he had hoped for. I don't remember saying that, but thank you. Okay. <laughs> it's in Provo. It's on your home field. Yeah, you got to defend LES. Like we were like Lavelle Edwards passed away. There's the patch and it's like, yeah, let's defend the stadium for And BYU stunk. What was BYU? Three and three. It's like, do it for Lavelle. Yes. Do it for every. Just yes. I don't care what your reasoning is. Just beat Utah in game one. Home Come on. game, top 15 opponent, preseason Pac-12 favorites, lost eight in a row. Let's go. It's Utah. You blew a 20-point lead. You can provide. Two games will go. It was recent. You can provide the ultimate buzz kill that you will hang over <laughs> every Utah fan's head for the rest of forever. I hate that that's what it is, but. It totally is. The, the pursuit of the buzz kill. Should BYU make shirts? I'll have Quest for Perfection. We're here to buzz kill yeah, your season. Buzz kill. Yeah, can we get Royal Blue t shirts just say buzz kill? Buzz kill with Zach Wilson. <laughs> I love it so much. Pac-12 sticker. Hey, speaking of the rivalry, when we talked about this at the beginning of the show, Bradley and I received some criticism for his critical comments of BYU that were taken out of context. And we want to dive into why... 
Fans are so passionate about this. And are they more passionate than the actual players? Listen to what Bradley and I said on the rivalry and what it means to the fans and players. I think the fans take it more uh, personal than the players. To be honest, I have a lot of friends on the BYU team. And uh, you know, my uncle's coach at BYU. It's not as serious as, as, serious as it seems for us players. Uh, we play the game and we entertain people. Uh, we're entertainers, that's what we do. And so just that to, to get the fans riled up, it's all for the fans. Now this is interesting because Bradley and I started some rivalry banter on Twitter a few months back, correct? Yeah. So he played into this I think before he re- the game. Well, I think he responded to Kairos Tonga, but he engaged is the point. He, he responded to a Utah fan. And then Kairos Tonga responded to what Bradley and I said about BYU. So, Mr. and I, technically... Whatever, he engaged. In, there was engagement there, correct. That said, it, it just, he says it's for the fans. Jerem, should the BYU-Utah matchup be more important to the actual players or the fans? No, it should matter more to the fans. I get that you'd want to... Have the play. well, it should matter more to the players. They play, the fans don't play. The fans care about one game more than the others. The players care about a lot of the games, right? Like, you think Utah's like, man, BYU, that's our sole focus. It's like, no, we want to win the Pac 12. We're in a power five league for BYU. If you beat Utah, that's going to change the season, but that's because history hasn't been kind, right? I think it should matter more to the fans. The fans engage like in the West where you have Utah and BYU fans in the same communities, whether it be Arizona, Vegas, obviously Utah, not as much in Idaho with Utah fans, more BYU fans there. Right. But like on the West coast, whatever it, but in Utah, like if you live in Draper or whatever, and you got like annoying Daryl in your ward, Oh yeah. It's like just hanging over your head. Yeah. It matters more to you than Bradley and I and Zach Wilson, because guess what? Zach Wilson's got to think about Utah and Tennessee and USC and Washington, and Toledo, and... His focus changes every seven days. Right, but we can sit here and talk about BYU and Utah all year, and it would be justified. The off-season buildup has made this a unique scenario. And I love it. Oh, and that's That's another reason why this is the biggest game in the Kalani Satake era, going back to our last Mm -hmm. topic, because it's the first time they have ever opened the season against each other. It's awesome. I love it. We do a countdown. Might as well be to Utah. How about next year we just do it to Utah regardless of who the uh, first team is? Yes. <laughs> right? Yes, yes. I don't even know. Who, who does BYU open up with next year? I, I, I can't tell you. I'm going to look it up. Who does BYU open the season against next year? It's Utah. It is Utah again. Okay, so, Jerem, here's the thing. Depending on who BYU is playing, this answer to the question changes for me. Because I think, all right, BYU is playing New Mexico State. Who should care more about this game, the fans or the players? <laughs> I think it should be the players. I think it's the players on that one. <laughs> yeah. It depends on the opponent. Yeah. With Utah, it is clearly more important to the fans on both sides. I don't care what Utah fans say. I do not care what any- – great, you're an outlier. You don't care about BYU. Good for you, okay? Most Utah fans still care passionately about BYU. Of course BYU. they do. Welcome it's to the having success rivalry. against BYU finally in the last 15 Tell you what, they'll right? care a lot about BYU if BYU has the buzzkill win <laughs> to open the season. It's a rivalry. It's great. <laughs> I love the back and forth. Let's go. Text to our question of the day. Is this BYU versus Utah matchup the biggest game in Kalani Satake's tenure? Let's go to Voice of the Nation. This is the Voice of the Nation on BYU Sports Nation. Hank.57 answers on Instagram. Absolutely. It'll be the 100th meeting between BYU and the red team. What? It is? According if, to Utah or BYU? If Kalani wins this on one, number. he will be loved by the fans and players alike, especially after the last three years of his career and the last 10 years of the rivalry. BYU can't let Utah dominate them an entire decade. You could argue it's been dominated no matter what the result is. But, yeah, no, amen to all that. Amen and amen. Coming up, how do Zach Wilson's first seven starts stats compare with some of the Cougar great? But first, Antonio Morales. We think he's athletic. He writes for the athletic. He is a USC Trojans football insider. Where does he see the national brand of USC finishing in the Pac-12? 
and how do they perceive BYU in Provo? This is BYU Sports Nation. This segment of BYU Sports Nation presented by BYU Food to Go, the MVP of your next event. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Tomorrow at noon Eastern, check out a two-hour edition of the show weekly. It's called The Best of BYU Sports Nation, live on BYU Radio. It's the best two hours of the week, including uh, conversations and uh, us being super sarcastic about Utah and the countdown and interviews. And This has been a wild week, right? Yeah, th- there, were, there are some things that will be... Uh... <laughs> Nick Emery and the Utes, the preseason pick. and yeah. They're going to have a hard time trying to pick which is the best. For Luckily, this, this is... Finally, we gave them two hours of good stuff this week. You know, <laughs> yes. it's been a few weeks since we so gave patient. them enough. Right? We are under five weeks from football. Live from Studio B with your day-to-day BYU Sports play-by-play, I am Spencer Linton alongside Jerem Jordan. I think today you're like Spender. You're like an alter ego with Yes, I voice. should be the alter ego with my yeah, yeah. modified voice. We'll come up with a name. Modified. That's we'll nice. We'll come up with a name. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we need, we need to discuss this. Joining us now on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline is USC football insider for The Athletic, Antonio Morales. I said earlier, I bet he's athletic because he writes for The Athletic. We'll let him decide that. Antonio, are you okay if we introduce you as an athletic writer for The Athletic? <laughs> That might be a bit of a stretch, but I'll let you guys run with it. All right. Okay, that's good. That's out of the way. Then let's go with this. USC and the quarterback position, one of the most heralded positions in all of college football with all of the illustrious history, Carson Palmer, Matt Leinert. Now is it JT Daniels or will it be Jack Sears for the Trojans? I'd still be, I'd be very surprised if JT Daniels wasn't starting week one. That's just based off of practice observations and taking the fact he started of last year, just these guys are going to be large, largely based, like the judgments are going to be largely based on practice, obviously. And he's the most steady practice player. Jack Sears did well in the game. He started last year against Arizona State, but he, he has a lot of highs and lows to his practice performances. And if you're a coach and you're kind of contemplating who's going to start on Saturday and what you're basing them off of kind of right now is practice. Uh, I think JT is the edge just because he's the most steady of the quarterback options. What's the expectation for USC two years ago, winning the Rose bowl in the PAC 12 and then last year, a, a dip to five and seven. So what's the expectation going into 2019? I mean, the expectation, the expectations kind of range from winning the PAC 12 South to going six and six and stuff like that. People really don't seem to have a real good handle on this team. The schedule is really tough. You don't see many teams going out there to be any power, many power five teams, like uh, scheduling a trip to BYU. Um, they have B, they have Utah on a short week after that. Who? Um, <laughs> and, and after that, and after that game, they have a game at Washington, then an off week, and a, a game at Notre Dame. Uh, it's a tough first six games. We'll find out how good they are early on, and that's not even mentioning Fresno State and Stanford before they get to BYU. Okay, because of the placement of the BYU game in Provo, are the Cougars a trap game for USC because of the Fresno State game before and a Stanford game right after. What do you think? Well, Fresno State, Sorry. Stanford, and then Utah. And then Utah. Right Sorry, yeah, as yeah. you said, on the short week. Do you think they're a trap game because of where they're in the schedule? I think you consider that um, a trap game just because Stanford, USC, is obviously a contested rivalry now. Um, they're, they're always playing early in the season, and that's a game that's always been circled as pretty important for USC and Stanford. So they're obviously going to have a lot of attention placed on that. Then you, they go to BYU, um, and then they have Utah, who's the Pac-12 preseason favorite now, which I think surprised many people. Um, and, you know, USC is going to want to get revenge for last year's game where they were embarrassed by Utah. Um, then, so you're sandwiching BYU in between that. I think you can consider it a trap game. This group of receivers for USC is very impressive. When I do my uh, receivers uh, preview in what we call 10 and 10, 
that a lot of these guys are going to be in there. Three dudes who returned that had at least 670 yards. By the way, BYU had one that had over 500. Uh, Amon Ra, <laughs> St. Brown, Tyler Vons, and Michael Pittman Jr. Are they the best receiver group in the Pac-12? Yeah, yeah. I think people are considering them one of the best receiver groups in the country. Um, I, I think I would still put them behind Alabama, Clemson, and schools like that. Uh, but they're up there. Um, I think they're definitely the best in the Pac-12. Pittman finally started kind of producing. He's he's always been a big play threat, uh, but last season was his real first season with kind of true production. Um, he's a big yards per catch guy. It's always a lot, a lot of big plays. Amon Ra is steady with the receptions and the yardage. Um, and Tyler Tyler Vaughn is a smooth receiver on the outside who who can do well in those contested catch situations. Um, so they're they're each a bit different, um, but the top three make a make a really good unit, and they've added depth at that position this off season through recruiting, uh, through the through the uh, signing, departure, and transfer of Brew McCoy. Uh, I don't think he'll play this year, but it's, that's good for the long term view of the position. And them signing a receiver like four star Cal Ford was good for the for the future of that group, too, once some of these guys leave. Antonio Morales with us on BYU Sports Nation, writes for The Athletic, covers USC football specifically. You can follow him on Twitter, at Antonio C. Morales. Let's talk about the Trojans head coach, Clay Helton. And as Jerem mentioned, coming off of a 5-7 and seven season, but before that went to the Rose Bowl, had a very successful campaign. Mm-hmm. Is he on the hot seat this year, given that he had to change over much of his staff? I think any time the AD feels the need to put out a statement saying he's bringing back his coach, I think there's some sort of pressure there. Um, and that's what Lynn Swan did after USC lost to Notre Dame last year and finished 5-7. and seven. He, he mentioned there's uh, deficiency, deficiencies across the board within the program. Um, and some people said if there's this many deficiencies, why is the head coach coming back? Um, but he elected to retain Clay Helton. Um, I think history suggests that if you hover around 500 or have a losing season as the USC coach, your days as the USC coach aren't going to last that much longer. Um, So we'll see what happens with Clay. Like I said, those first six games are obviously a a big indicator of how things will go. Um, I know if you're more on the pessimistic side, of the USC fan base, they're probably saying, well, this is a team, this is a program that's the last two coaches have been fired midseason. If he gets off to a bad start, will he be fired midseason? Um, so we'll see what happens. Those first six games are, are crucial. If they can get through those with a decent record, it sets up well for a nice second half run and for Clay to um, stabilize things a little bit. If that happens, at least let him go on the plane ride home this time, unlike the previous incident, right? <laughs> yeah, that would, that would be uh, nice. Yeah, I think uh, after they lost to uh, Alabama in 2016 when Kiffin was the offensive coordinator and he was tweeting out the time, the time of when he got fired on the tarmac, um, I don't know if that will ever happen again. <laughs> <laughs> it was weird. Let's finish with this. What's your perception of BYU football going into 2019? I was just looking into it right now. It seems like they were kind of young at quarterback. Um, and some other positions last year. Um, the most I kind of watched of them was when they played Wisconsin and they had that upset win, um, which at the time was pretty impressive. I think Wisconsin was top five team in the country around that time. Um, I'm interested to see how USC will match up in the trenches with BYU because an area where – People usually have doubts about USC these days. When, when USC was great last decade, the offensive line, they, they handled things in the trenches, both offensively and defensively. Um, that's kind of dipped and been one of the reasons why they haven't been as dominant. The skill players are still there, uh, but they haven't been as dominant on both sides of the line. So I'm interested to see how they match up with BYU, which is typically a bigger, more physical, an older team, more mature team. Um, in the trenches, I'm interested to see how they kind of match up there and see how USC handles that in that in that environment. Antonio, great stuff, man. We appreciate the insight into USC. Thanks for the time. Oh, no problem. Thanks, guys. 
And Tony Morales on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, you know why we show how. He brought it up. Brought but, up the age. But, it, 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 lightly. It's fun. But does he mean maturity, just in experience yeah, he, he on the say, offensive line? He didn't say going older on a mission players. Is he didn't advantage. say older yeah. players. Yeah. He just You're said right. maturity. You're right. You're right. Thank okay. you. You're right. I'm... Coming up, <laughs> how does BYU fill Nick Emery's spot? He went on a mission. That was a huge advantage. Later, <laughs> and the latest on the new hire today on the BYU staff. But first, how does Zach Wilson compare to the other BYU quarterback greats? We'll find out in just the stats. Is it way too early to do this? Well, too bad. We're doing it. I had a broadcasting advantage going on a mission. I'm way better because I went on a mission. This is BYU Sports Nation. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation on a Friday. This is how we do it. Still awaiting the name for my alternate voice, my modified voice. Scratch your lint. <laughs> it's it's got to be some type of sultry thing, you know? <laughs> That's one version, I guess. One take. Here are today's headlines. BYU men's basketball head coach Mark Pope hires Nathan Bubas as the new coordinator of strategy and analytics. Bubis' main responsibilities include players, coaches, and recruiting film, self-scouting, opponent scouting, and conducting post-game reports, plus collecting recruitment data. That dude's going to do a lot of things. Bubis, by the way, previously worked as a coaching associate for the Los Angeles Lakers of the NBA during the 2018-19 season. Mark Pope, in the release about this, said he is a game-changer for this BYU basketball program. He told us he's already having a big impact last yes, week. Yeah. yeah. Team Fredette, led by Coach Rose, came from behind to beat City Team Blazers 99-96 in the basketball tournament. They trailed by 22 points. How did that happen? In the second half. Crazy. Tyler House started, played four minutes, didn't record any stats. What's the point of that? Team Fredette plays again tonight against Challenge ALS, 11 Eastern on ESPN3. Hashtag free Tyler Haas. It's like, is that a publicity stunt? I don't know. Did he get hurt? Like, what happened? BYU grad Connor McMillan takes fourth in the United States Track and Field Outdoor Championships. 10K with a time of 28 minutes, 20 seconds, 1800s. McMillan took third in the NCAA 10K earlier this year. Third in the NCAA, and then fourth against all the pros and amateurs. If the can the amateurs compete in that, or because he graduated, I don't know. Junior defensive lineman Uriah Leatawa is named to the Werfel Trophy watch list. Named to the. the team that runs it up against their opponents. Oh, wait, no, that's a different Florida thing. My bad. <laughs> Which recognizes the player who excels in a combination of community service, athletic, and academic achievements. Nobody was on the Paul Hornig watch list for most versatile player. Perhaps Jaron Hall will be on that next season. Jerem, he's only started seven games. Mm-hmm. But it's seven games. So why not take a look at Zach Wilson's numbers as he approaches his sophomore season as the quarterback, y'all, at BYU and how – he compares to other BYU greats. Do we dare? Yes, it's just the stats. When Zach Wilson took over the reins as the BYU quarterback last season, he became the youngest quarterback ever to start a game for the Cougars. In seven games started by Wilson, his 65.9 completion percentage was the highest of any Cougar quarterback in Independence, with a minimum of 175 attempts. With Zach Wilson at the helm, could quarterback you be back at BYU? Let's look at just the stats. Through seven starts, Wilson threw 11 touchdowns for 1,514 yards and only three interceptions. His 11 touchdowns in his first seven starts are more than BYU legends Steve Young and Jim McMahon, who each threw for 10 touchdowns in their first seven starts, while his 65.9% completion percentage trumps names such as Young, McMahon, Detmer, Bosco, Hall, and Beck in their first seven starts, and Wilson's three interceptions are less than all six BYU greats. In their first full seasons as starting quarterbacks, these six BYU legends each threw for 3,000-plus yards, 20-plus touchdowns, and a completion percentage of over 60%. For Wilson, a 3,000-yard season would only be the second for BYU in independence, and 20-plus touchdown season would break a three-year drought for Cougar quarterback. However, since independence began in 2011, there has only been one season where one quarterback has started every game for the Cougars in a season. This season, BYU has five quarterbacks listed on the roster, three of whom have seen game action. Wilson, sophomore Joe Critchlow, and redshirt freshman Jaron Hall. Hall went 12 for 14 for 203 yards and two touchdowns in the spring game. He is expected to begin the season as Wilson's backup. Whether this season holds one true starter throughout the season or multiple, BYU is not lacking in depth at the quarterback position. 
That's just the stats. Yeah, QBU, no. You'd have to have multiple again, right? Um, when you had Max Hall and John Beck, we were like, they are in the Pantheon now. Yes, yes. Taysom Hill entered the Pantheon. But you need multiple guys. So if Zach Wilson's awesome and then Jaron Hall's awesome, which, by the way, they're only separated by a year, so that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Good to have, too. Interesting. The thing that stuck out the most was, oh, wow, Zach Wilson was better in his first seven than th- ding, 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 right? That's impressive. That is very interesting. That's impressive, yeah. For sure. Now, I'm not sure any of the BYU quarterbacks will face a gauntlet of a schedule like Zach Wilson. This year, yeah. The la- Last year, the last seven games that Zach played are akin to what some schedules were like in the sure, WAC. Sure, right? sure, sure. Because there yeah. was Utah, there was Boise State in that, right? There, there weren't a ton of others that were like, Super hard. Hawaii wasn't that good. New Mexico State, obviously, and so on. Western Michigan didn't end up being that good of a team. BYU put 42 points up in the second half. That was awesome. Um, I'm excited to see what he does his sophomore year. He's playing his second, third, fourth, and fifth power fives yes. consecutively. And how much did the 18-for-18 18 18 performance in the bowl game affect those stats in the seven games? Like, what were the stats before yes. he played that good game point. against Western Michigan? Before we go to break, at the casual hippie, Darth Linton. Spencer Darth Linton. Spencer Batman voice Linton. Spencer Froggy <laughs> Linton. Spencer Power of the Wasatch Linton. I sound like a frog. Cougar Grout Linton. Oh, yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. All right, we've got some uh, submissions coming in for my modified voice name. Modified's one word for it. Coming up, <laughs> Jacob Brugman stays hot in AAA. We'll tell you how. And men's basketball says the coach Nick Robinson in studio to discuss the many changes this offseason, including Nick Emery's Retirement from basketball. How will it affect the roster? This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. If you can't watch or listen to BYU Sports Nation live at noon Eastern, no worries. Download the podcast on iTunes, TuneIn, or Google Play, and enjoy on demand. I've got an idea for this modified voice name. Mm. How about the last name is Lipton? Lipton? <laughs> because I need you some need, Lipton tea. You need some tea? <laughs> okay. Is that a tea we can consume? I'm super confused on, like, which tea is okay and which isn't. You know what I mean? We'll work on those particulars. No, no tea, but no one's actually written this down anywhere. <laughs> like, this tea is fine. Well, it says who? No, yeah. I just need a first name. Lipton is the last name. Okay. I like it. If you're sponsored, that would be awesome. <laughs> I'm Spencer Lipton. I've legally changed my name because I'm sponsored. I'm Sean Lipton. <laughs> I don't know. You just change your name. Yeah. I think Dan Patrick's name is Dan Pugh. He goes by Patrick, though. You can have a stage name. I can have a stage name. Yeah, it's okay. a little late for that, but my okay. stage name. Yeah. Joining us now in Studio B, returning to the program. Always nice to have him with us. BYU men's basketball assistant coach in his first season with the Cougars, Nick Robinson. Nick, welcome back to Studio B. It's great to be back. What's up, Nick? This has been an interesting week for BYU basketball with the official announcement of Nick Emery deciding to step away from basketball. We spoke with Nick yesterday. He said in his word he feels like a huge weight's been lifted from his shoulders. He's got a family. He got remarried. Everything has changed for him. So I know you're well aware of his situation. But now you have to turn around and be like, okay, well, what are we going to do with the roster? So what happens to the roster now that Nick Emery is not a part of the program? Yeah, well, Nick Emery obviously came to a big decision. And, uh, you know, I've been fortunate to get to know Nick, uh, the 2019 version of Nick Emery, the past three months. And he is uh, one of the most creative individuals as we've seen off the ba- or on the basketball court, but also off the court, right? And the, the big change in life for him, uh, what a big step for him. Uh, so we're excited for, you know, what's ahead for him in the future. Um, and obviously, you know, grateful for his wonderful contributions to BYU basketball. Uh, but moving forward, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, recruiting is a continual process. And so, you know, for us, uh, we'll continue to look and find, right, the right fit that will be able to help fill out the roster, uh, whether it's for this season or for next season. So is there a possibility that you bring in a guy and you have him sit out because he's got a – redshirt due to transfer rules or is it do you give the scholarship to somebody else like how do you how do you manage that because it's kind of hard at this point to get someone who's really going to help you right is it a little late in the game for that yeah so at this stage right with the way the transfers work right there's still individuals that are out there that have played at great programs right and so we'll consider some of those that we may have worked with uh you know over the past couple of months right that but cut off communication um but uh, you know obviously right we want to find the best right player that's going to be able to help us whether it's this year or next year so one of those options would be right to bring in somebody that might be able to sit out and 
improve their game, right, for the next year, uh, like Wyatt or Rich, and then, you know, they'd be uh, ready to play next season. And it almost feels like uh, there's so many good options and seniors on this team that perhaps it almost simplifies the process in a way. I don't know how you feel about it. You want as many good players as possible, but, um, you know, a guy like a Connor Harding who would have competed with Nick perhaps for a starting spot, perhaps this enables him in a new way or other guys like that and Zach Selyus and whatnot. Yeah, well, with Nick's right retirement, right, it obviously provides opportunity for guys that are currently on the roster, um, you know, which may have been different, like you said. Uh, but, you know, each guy this summer, right, has been improving, right, in the weight room, on the court, uh, which has been fantastic. So it's going to be really interesting as we get into practice, right, in the next week, week or week and a half uh, to see kind of who steps up in some of those roles that, uh, you know, may have been filled otherwise. Yeah, another guy we were talking about is maybe it's Jesse Wade. What does his role become now that Nick is gone? And how has his game developed? Because we don't know a ton about him as a BYU basketball player. We saw him sparing minutes at Gonzaga. He's a Utah kid. He's back in Provo. So how does Jesse Wade potentially fill this gap and help this team? Yeah, Jesse, right, as well as, right, continue to improve like each of our guys, right? Obviously, we know that he shoots the ball extremely well, um, but he's had limited game experience, uh, right, at uh, the Division One level, at extremely high level. So, you know, I think all of our guys are uh, on edge, and rightfully so, in an excited, right, anticipatory way because, right, with Coach Pope, right, a new system offensively, defensively, as well well as the opportunity they kind of see ahead for themselves individually, but also for us as a team, I think it's exciting for everybody. So, you know, but much of those roles are still kind of to be determined uh, just because we haven't had, right, a full, right, practice, right, in successive days where we're able to kind of, you know, mix and match guys and, and see how they compete at, in those different roles. So you haven't put in the offense and defense per se with the players fully as a team? Is that what you're saying? That's correct. Okay, so yeah. the week or week week and a half as you guys get extra practice time to get ready for Italy mm -hmm. middle of August that's when you put it in correct okay. yeah right now it's been small group right maybe pieces of the puzzle right so we kind of get a feel of you know guys and where they might fit right in certain places but until you get to five on five and get kind of the whole picture offensively and defensively right it's really you know a challenge to be able to tell where guys are going to fit can you describe to us kind of the theory or, or uh, what types of offense and defense uh, perhaps we might see this year? Yeah, I mean, defensively, right, we want to have a base of man-to-man, -man, right? We want to be able to guard, right, our position, our guys, and be in a position to be able to help each other, right, to where we're a great defensive team, um, or at least better than maybe we uh, are expected to be. Um, and then offensively, right, like Coach Pope, right, has coached in the past and like the guys, right, have been playing, right, in previous seasons, we want to be a high octane, right? A high pace, um, be able to move the basketball, right? Have multiple guys involved throughout the game. Um, and so, you know, the little nuances, right? The coach Pope Springs, right? Added to what the guys are familiar with, right? All the experience that they have, right? In playing this game at a high level. Um, we're really excited about what, uh, what possibilities are there. BYU men's basketball assistant coach Nick Robinson with us on BYU Sports Nation. You announced the hiring of Nathan Bubis today. He's the coordinator of strategy, if you will. He does so and many analytics. different things and analytics. Very technical. Like reading term. his list of responsibilities is kind of a whirlwind. This guy does a lot. But Mark Pope told us last week when we were filming a commercial, he's already affected and impacted our program and team in a major way. He's a game changer. Why is that? Yeah, Coach Bubas, I mean, he comes with great experience, right, from Boston College to the Los Angeles Lakers, right, and the variety of the experiences that he's had uh, from a strategy standpoint, right, as well as from an analytical standpoint uh, is absolutely incredible, right? We've been able to learn from him on a consistent basis, right, uh, from a very detailed, right, manner, both from the NBA and the way the game's played there, right, and the trends, but then also on the technological right, technology side of things, right, he brings, right, all of the NBA technology, right, and how that fits into a program um, to what we want to be able to accomplish at the highest level. And so um, he's been fantastic uh, for, you know, each of us as coaches, but then also for our guys and our players to be able to understand how you compare to this guy, right, in the NBA, mm. 
And he's not, it's not like, you know, he has to, right, go and do the research for three hours. It's at the top of his brain, like right now, which wow. is really, really neat. Wow. So give us an example of, uh, yeah, more things, like average things he's doing because he's the video coordinator, but he's much more than that, right? Yeah. And it's 2019, the game has changed. Yeah, so I mean, in terms of, right, being the director of strategy, right, and analytics, right, he's worked with, right, some of the top players, right, in the NBA, right, last year for the Lakers. Well, there right? was and, one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, but then also had to evaluate them from a film perspective. So when it comes to player development, right, he's able to see our guys on the court in film, right, and then, right, pick three or four guys that this individual is like, hmm. right? So now we're able to go through, analyze that film, right, and splice it up in a way, right, to where we're able to see, hey, you know, right, you know, you can be like this, but you've got to do this, right? And hmm. so that's been really neat. That's awesome. Let's finish with this. What kind of advantage did you inherit as a first-year staff being able to go to Italy and have a summer trip with this specific team before the season begins? Well, the summer trips are absolutely incredible from the standpoint that, one, you get to bond, right, through the experience of going over to Italy, right, to experience all those sites, right, the incredible history. Um, but also these 10 practices that were afforded, right, you're also able to bond in a sense, right, of creating trust, right, through winning plays, through competition. And so that experience, right, in itself puts you 10 practices practices ahead, right, of the competition. And so with a new staff, for us to be able to inherit this opportunity is absolutely incredible for all of us. That's exciting. If you need two other people to go with you and document it, <laughs> all right. we know two guys. We're here. Yeah. We're here. In Italy. You, I'd be most. happy to miss fall camp. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot, Nick. Thank you. It, Coming up, did Team Fredette advance in the basketball tournament? And why a 16-inning game in the majors holds both a former Cougar in it and my ride and shout out. And one former BYU football player had Joker face paint and had an interception yesterday. Good what? stuff on the way. It's BYU Sports Nation. Shout out to today's guest, Antonio Morales, writer for The Athletic, covering USC and BYU basketball men's assistant coach, Nick Robinson. I think Nick Robinson's more athletic than Antonio. Correct. Shows on demand via the podcast and BYU TV and BYU radio apps. Let's whip it. It's time for the Cougar Whip Around Basketball. Men's basketball coach Mark Pope hires Nathan Bubis as the new coordinator of strategy and analytics. Came from the Lakers. He's doing more than just being the video coordinator. We just talked to Nick Robinson. Major impact on this staff and uh, really cool in 2019 to have a, a dude that's in charge of strategy and analytics. Cougars in Pro Hoops. Team Fredette led by head coach Dave Rose and assistant coach Jimmer Fredette overcame a 22-point deficit to win 99-96 against the City Team Blazers. Tyler House started for Team Fredette, played five minutes, didn't record any stats. Tonight, Team Fredette plays Challenge ALS at 11 Eastern. You can watch it on ESPN3. Track and field. Here we read Connor McMillan took fourth in the USA Track and Field Outdoor Championships with the time of 28-2018. McMillan took third in the NCAA 10K earlier this year. Football. Junior defensive lineman Uriah Leatawa on the Werfel Trophy watch list, recognizing the player who excels in a combination of community service and athletic and academic achievements. No Cougars make the Horning Award watch list for most versatile player. Perhaps Jaron Hall will be on that next season. Cougars in the NFL. Two more Cougars start training camp today. Daniel Sorensen of the Chiefs with head coach Andy Reid, as well as second-year linebacker your boy Fred Warner with the Niners. Cougars in the Major League. Taylor Cole pitched one scoreless inning in a 16-inning melee, a loss to my Baltimore Orioles last Pathetic. night. Cougars in the minors. Colton Mahoney pitched six scoreless innings, allowed two hits, struck out eight, and a 3-1 win for or against the Biloxi Shuckers. What is he with the Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp? Mahoney 4-0 this year, 2.08 ERA. In AAA, Jacob Brugman won for three with a home run in a 4-3 loss to the Reno Aces. And Michael Rucker pitched two innings, allowing one run in a 7-4 loss to the Montgomery Biscuits. Today's rise and shout-outs. For me, Jeremy, I'm going back to that 16-inning game. <laughs> Outfielder Steve Wilkerson for the Baltimore Orioles became the first position player ever to record a save. Nice. He only needed 14 pitches, and none of those pitches were over 60 miles an hour. I feel like you could have done that. Albert Pujols was the last out. Yikes. He's way past his prime. <laughs> and Tyron Matthew, safety for the Kansas City Chiefs, tweeted, Rooming with Daniel Sorensen, I just know I won't be getting my room 
Check this camp. <laughs> Dirty Dan. Clean living with Dirty Dan. Dirty Dan. <laughs> Hilarious. Question of the day. Is this BYU-Utah matchup the biggest game in Kalani Satake's tenure? Our elite voice of the day. Presented by Sundance Mountain Resort celebrating 50 years. That Colonel underscore James 83 says yes. Win. They can get the weight off their minds and possibly have a special season. Lose, BYU could possibly start 0-4. It'd be bad. Same game. Sorry to Dennis Pitta. Ran out of time per the norm. For Jerem, I am Spencer. Shout out to Noah Hartsock. See you for BYU Sports Nation on Monday at noon Eastern. Go Cougs. That was Hartsock.